The sponsor of our show today is CNE Wildlife. CNE Wildlife partnered up with North American Deer Talk. We're incredibly grateful for that. If you get a, a chance or an opportunity, say thank you to them. And the reason is really simple. They have 30 years of commitment to all natural probiotics. This commitment's really a passion for them. And they've established that through university research at Texas Tech. Whether that be their fawn paste, their top score product, their show choice, farm pack, all the various products they have, they really provide a service and a set of products that helps your herd thrive. Give Sadie a call over there at c and and uh, order up some good stuff. We think you'll like it. We know we do. We've been uh, product users for almost 15 years now. Um, we feel it's the best around. So get you some c and wildlife today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of North American Deer Talk. It is episode 53, and I am joined with the president of Your Nadifa, Mr. Jacques DeMoss. Jacques, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. You know, I uh, I was I was doing some editing of a podcast here from last week, and of course, I have this, uh, I'm fancy, I have this fancy microphone in front of me, right? <laughs> And every time I do the intro, I get my my mouth real close to the microphone, and it 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 blows the 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 my ears out because I'm listening on on headphones when I'm, when I'm looking <laughs> at editing stuff. So I have to stop myself. I just need to like sit back and do my intro. But anyway, I I appreciate you joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. So uh, I um I try to stay active in the deer world uh, and all things. Um, you know, unfortunately, we have to play in a political realm, but, you know, all things uh, association level and organizations and things like that, because I feel there's a ton of value there and they're important to the kind of the overall ecosystem and, and health. Um, so having obviously the president of the National Association on to discuss a few things, uh, I think will be of, of great benefit uh, to the listeners. Now, I know you had uh, the annual conference here uh two months ago or so, two and a half months ago. Um, Tail in March. Yep. 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 Um, can you just give us a, a quick recap on um, kind of your overall thoughts and like maybe some of the things that, that went on there? Yeah, sure. Um, well, as you know, you know, when COVID hit, we had to cancel uh, our uh, annual event two years in a row. So this is the first in-person uh, conference we've had in three years. Uh, so we were a little nervous, you know, because we, you know, don't know what everybody's expectations are. You know, still people still had some issues with traveling, and we weren't sure exactly what to expect. But we were pleasantly surprised in, in every regard. Uh, attendance was above our expectations. Uh, presentations were good. The auction uh, brought a lot of money. Um, the, the the items, the, the consignments, you know, the donated items, the, you know, was were all just really top notch. And you know, the energy in the room. Um, in the in the exhibit hall, the, you know, we had over 100 exhibitors. Um, they were anxious to get back in front of customers, in front of the industry. Um, the presenters did a fantastic job. A lot of attendance in those in those individual breakout presentations, um, and then just in general in the meals uh, and in the, the the nights of the auctions, you could just feel a lot of energy in the room, and it was like the industry is back, you know. And so it was just a really nice uh, welcome back to to in person conference. So, yeah, overall, super, super good. Uh, you know, really, like I said, good attendance. Uh, you know, we came away uh, from a fundraising standpoint in a good fiscal position. So that was always good to, to see. Definitely needed after a couple of years of, of not having those events. Um, you know, like I said, we, we had some, some really top-notch presenters. You know, we had Dr. Seabury come uh, to uh, discuss the ongoing work that he's doing with the genomic predictive values and things like that with the, with the genetic testing, trying to, to – bring as many people uh, into a level of understanding and participation in that program as possible. So it's always good to have him there in person to, to speak with the membership. And then we had Dr. Uh, Dr. Greenlee and Kassman come from the Ames, Iowa facility, uh, talking about their ongoing research with chronic wasting disease and some of the resistance testing and some of the, uh, just the updates and what's happened in the last couple, three years, because uh, uh, it's been almost, well, it's been not difficult. It's been impossible to get those guys out anywhere because of all the governmental restrictions with COVID travel. So it was nice to be able to reconnect with with industry researchers and let our membership see what what's going on out there to benefit them. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's great, and I I kind of you you mentioned the you know overall excitement that was was present that you could kind of feel at the at the event, and uh, I was fortunate enough to attend, and I I got the same thing right. Like overall, it was just really good to see people again um, mm-hmm. after not being able to to see them for a couple of years, and just you know hang out and you know, have a coffee or a beer, uh, depending on the time of day and, and just chat, you know, chat, chat some deer with people. Right. Um, you know, s- just seeing people again. And unfortunately you're in, uh, Missouri today and I'm in Pennsylvania and we're, we're doing this over zoom, but like, that's the reality of, 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 you know, society today, a lot of that's electronic fair. stuff and just good to hang out with people. Yeah. It was nice just to be able to shake hands with folks. It, it, yeah. There was a lot, there's, you know, during COVID, you don't realize how much you lose. And then when you, you get an opportunity to get back and have physical interaction with folks, it, it makes a big difference, a, a big difference. Yeah, and there's a lot of, and we also had, a, and one thing I failed to mention was, you know, the, the, the new deer farmer conference is all, you know, the, the seminar is always a big component of, of uh, our annual event. And, um, you know, again, not knowing really what the status of the industry was at, you know, during COVID, you know, how many new people we come from, you know, coming in and whatnot. It was nice to see a really heavy, attended new deer farmer seminar and uh and i appreciate you and, and your companies for for presenting on that uh and helping out with that because like i said i think it was it was very successful had some new faces and some really engaged people so that that kind of adds to the excitement too when, you, when you're already excited about getting back together and having that face face and you get a whole slew of new faces people interested that that injects a lot of new energy into the industry as well no it's a it's a great point i think that that's uh you know people people ask like, Hey, you know, what is, what does an Adifa do? Right. And like, they're like, Oh, they're having a conference. It's just for them getting money. But like the new deer farmer seminar is, is a, is a great point, right? Like it, it, um, it brings together a lot of really sharp and, and good minds uh, to present all sorts of different aspects of, of, you know, what deer farming is generally. And uh, so I, I appreciate you, you bringing that up uh, knowing that the, the fundraising uh, efforts, uh, are important, right? Because like with, without having, uh, those, those types of efforts go on and, and generating capital for the DEFA to function, uh, it just, it's, it's, uh, it, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's just, it's an important role, uh, that, that plays into, into the mix. It um, is. what do you guys do with that money? Like, what do you, like, obviously like you have this, you have this fundraiser, it goes really well, you know, you have some cash there, what what is the process that the board takes to kind of review what goes on for the next year? Walk us through sure. that. Sure. Um, well, first and foremost, you know, as what people have to understand is the DFA, even though it's a, a nonprofit association, it it's a business. It, it is run like a business, and so we have to have money going coming in because we definitely have money going out. You know, we have office staff. We have Sean Shaper's salary as our executive director. You know, we have travel expenses that that he incurs, that I incur, that board members incur for for different event attendance and things like that. Um, you know, we have the, the production cost that goes along with maintaining our social media presence, uh, the production of our, our magazine uh, issues that we put out several times a year, um, and the, the expense of the conference itself, which is, which is a big capital outlay. Uh, so having a good conference one year springboards you into the conference the next year. It gives you that much more fiscal cushion to provide a really good experience for the members who choose to travel. Because we know you're giving away, you're giving up time with your family. We know you're giving up time at your farms, your other businesses, and you're taking the time and the expense to travel to this event. So it's up to us. It's our obligation to provide a really good experience for you. So having a good income from the previous year, you know, gives us the cushion to do that. Uh, it also allows us, you know, to have money in reserve for operating our, our constituent parts like the GMS software you know, component, if it were to need an update or, or, or whatever, we, we have the funding available to maintain and monitor and, and support that. Uh, as well as you know, we get a lot of funding requests from individual states uh, to help with you know, legal fees, uh, you know, advocacy expenses, things like that. Um, you know, it's not uncommon at all for Sean or I, more so Sean, to have to drop what he's doing and fly to some state for some event. You know, and all that costs money. And so, having a good, uh, in, you know, having a good fundraiser uh, gives us uh, the money to be reactive and flexible. Um. So, as part of the um, conference, kind of wrapping up we touched on the fundraiser side and we're going to come we're going to come back to the money in a second Mm -hmm. um 
each each year you get some new board members that come on. There's a little bit of rotation there. Um, right. You know, what is what does that do for the board when you have some some new folks come in? We have a we've been I've been blessed. You know, I've been a member of the board for a number of years. Been pre- I was reelected as president for my second term this year. Um, and I've been blessed from a leadership role to have a really good, dynamic, engaged board. You know, anyone who's ever served on a state level board before or a board of any nature, you know, knows that, um, you know, that, that old adage that, you know, 1% of the people do 100% of the work and the other 99% of the people do 100% of the, the griping. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in, in that this board's not like that. Everyone's engaged, you know, for one way or another. Um, most people have come from their own state board experiences and whatnot, and a lot of times in leadership roles. So these people know how a board functions, they're engaged, they make the phone calls, they do the work. Um, but what, to answer your point, bringing in new, new members and rotating new members in gives you fresh set of eyes and fresh set of ideas. Um, and I am capitalizing on that uh, as one of my goals for the year. Uh, for, my, for my own personal administration, I, I'm looking to ways to like I said before, you know, to improve the experience of the annual event. So we actually formed a new committee of engaged members that are actually, you know, working. In fact, we have a meeting call, a call tomorrow um, to to discuss, you know, how we can make this event better and uh, take something that's already working and make it that much better. Uh, and so I'm lucky in that I have a great deal of participation by a great group of folks on, on the board. So to answer your question, yeah, the, the new rotation is vital. Uh, now we have a lot of guys that have been on the board for a long time, um, and and we welcome that too because that level of experience is is vital. Uh, but the new faces and the and the new energy definitely helps. Nice. Um, so like when you, we've heard about some of the initiatives you guys want to work on. Obviously the the membership drives a a big part of that. Um, you know, if you had to highlight just you know like maybe one other item, two other items. Um, you know, outside of that membership drive that like you really would like to focus on this year, you know, what do you think that is? Um, well, I'll be honest with you. The, the, the thing that I, I want to improve on uh, very first thing, uh, and I think anybody in the DFA would, would tell you this, is that we're horrible at self-promotion. And, uh, and so that being said, um, you know, I want to, as an initiative, one of the things we're working on is to improve our social media presence, not just more and better, but, you know, actual you know, value for your membership, actual content that you can use, um, and also improve the, the timeliness and the content of the magazine, the physical magazine that goes out. Um, because one thing we, we like I said, we're, we're bad about self-promotion, um, but I, one of the things I want to be able to, at the end of the year, I want to be confident in saying that we're making this membership push. And it's one thing to, to ask for, for members and to get more members, um, but it's, it's, that's not enough. You have to be able to give them value for that membership. And so that's what we're working on right now. Great. No, it's, it's good to hear, you know, it's, it's always a challenge um, to be self-reflective, right? Like, cause you're, it's, it's hard to criticize yourself. Right. But like, right. as a, as a board, you really have to kind of look above that and say, Hey, here's the things that like, we're not good at. And here's what our members are actually telling us they want. And right. I try to try to focus on those things. And like, it's good that you guys have come to the place and said, look, like we're bad at telling people what Nadifa does and, and, you know, like, we're going to work on that. So, and, and for so many years, and I, and I was, you know, I was president of the Missouri Deer Association for a number of years while we were having our legal battle there. And, you know, you get in a trap, you know, you're so busy doing things that you don't take the time to tell people what you're doing. You know, yeah. and, and it, it seems counterintuitive, but it's true. There's so much energy is devoted to just getting it done and getting it done well and getting it done right, that sometimes you don't take the time to be introspective and, and say, well, you know, this is what we're doing, you know, even the good stuff, you know, we're not good at telling people the, the big successes and the things that we do really well. Um, but you're right. It's equally as important to, to sit there and, and be self-deprecating and say, you know, this, we are, we are really bad at this. We've got right. to improve this. And, and you have to take yourself out of that situation. You have to set the ego aside and remember from a 10,000 foot view, you're here to represent the industry, not, not Jacques Moss or, or, or not Josh Newton. You know, yep. it, it is, you know, what, what am I doing well to benefit the industry? What am I doing badly? And, and you gotta, you gotta one, recognize it and two, care enough to fix it. You know? And so right now that's, that's the other benefit of the board that I didn't mention is that everyone's like that. Everyone's like, yes, you know, let's do this. You know, and I don't have to ask people, Hey, I need help. It's people calling me saying, Hey, I think this is a great idea. Let's try this. And so, you know, two things that I think are more valuable than anything are new ideas from the board and input from the members. And I solicit more of that any chance I get. 
Um, we don't get quite enough input from the members. You know, I'll, I'll occasionally on a Facebook group see a, a post that's critical of Medifa, and and I'm you know I'm I'm first to own it. And like I said, when you don't self promote, uh, you're letting people kind of dictate the narrative. You know, and so uh, we have to do better about that. But I do like to hear from membership. I'd love I would love to set up a an information line where people can say, I mean, even anonymously say, hey, you know, I'm concerned about this issue. What are y'all doing on this? Or, or maybe we need to spend more effort or more money or more time on this, you know, and so that's valuable to help us drive, you know, what we can do as deliverables for our membership. No, I, I, I like that. And I, I appreciate it. Um, you, you, now you mentioned successes and I, I've, I've been fortunate to participate in what I feel are some successes of, of Nadifa in a, a supporting role. Um, uh, you and I and and uh, a few others had the opportunity to to head to DC and um, <clears throat> you know we Nadifa you know have really spearheaded the request for dollars to support you know CWD generally right whether that be uh, research dollars whether that be implementation of the program etc. I want to focus on the research side because. I find that to be the most compelling and interesting thing for the industry as a whole. Um, so we have to jump back like three years and, and you know, that the Chronic Wasting Res Disease Research and Management Act really, like Nadifa was responsible for that. Um, and it's grown to a different place. You want to just walk us through that that process because I I do think it's interesting and it puts perspective for the listeners and people that like they wonder, hey, what does Nadifa do? This is how long this stuff takes. So right. just right. just give us some of that. Yeah, um, and without you know boring boring people to death too much, the legislative process just kind of give them the highlights. You know, three or four well actually way before that, a, a decade ago. Um, Sean Schaefer and, and the existing board at that time started working with uh, USDA and APHIS and our Capitol Hill Consulting Group for our lobbyist in D.C. Um, to, um, you know, to increase um, funding, increase our response for chronic waste and disease. You know, up until, the, you know, for well, actually, and it still exists, you know, state level agencies, you know, that they only had one, that they were a one uh tune horn, you know, they only did, you know, quote, management, which is basically just culling and testing of wild deer to tell us something we already knew, that chronic waste disease exists on the landscape. Uh, no management plan, no end game, uh, no way to look down the road and say, this is how we're going to manage CWD. This is a solution-based uh, system, not just a reaction-based system. So work has been done uh, both on the state level and on mainly on the federal level to bring an increased level of funding uh, available to do just that, to bring a, a goal, an end game, a management plan. And so a number of years ago, legislation was passed uh, increasing and making available funding uh, for just that. Um, because let's face it, you know, nobody is pro-disease. Um, for years and years, we would go to the Capitol and we just get our teeth kicked in uh, and have a really hard time meeting with people because uh, the wildlife agencies had, you know, put the the fear of God in everybody, you know, the, the boogeyman of chronic waste and disease. And, you know, we were coming at it with a, a very science-based, uh, non-emotional type approach. Uh, they were coming at it, you know, thinking that it's going to lead to the next whitetail extinction. So, so we had this dichotomy, you know, we had to go up to the Capitol and try to ask for funding. Uh, but yet at the same time, the wildlife groups were up there, you know, spouting that, you know, chronic waste disease had, you know, started in the farms and that we we're, we're the cause and we're spreading it around the United States. And so we had a lot of PR issues that we were dealing with. And over the last couple of three years, um, a lot of work has been done. And, and I have to lay that at the feet of Sean Schaefer because he has done an incredible amount of work uh, bridging these relationships between us and the, the wildlife groups um, because we were asking for funding and at the same time they're asking for funding. And so these lawmakers kind of get put in a pinch. And over the last couple of three years, we kind of moved toward a level of detente. And this past year, we were able to coordinate together with those wildlife groups in a common ask for funding uh, that diverts the money basically right down the middle. Well, there's actually, there's an appropriations ask that, that goes with our herd management program, but there's also a, a funding ask uh, through a new bill. Uh, so I'll kind of split that up. The, the research bill uh, was actually, uh, in, it was actually, um, filed by Senator Hoban from North Dakota uh, in Sean's state. And then uh, uh, 
uh, believe it was a Democrat Heinrich from New Mexico on the Senate side. And so basically, to not be, not belabor it too much, it's a seventy million dollar ask, uh, split in that, down the middle, uh, half going to state uh, departments of ag and wildlife agencies, and the other half to industry, uh, administered through cooperative agreements to to let them have their management. You know, and, and if you look at the management, you know, they're looking at, they're looking at, um, you know, the, the culling and the things that they've always done up till now. And that, and that, that continues. Um, but what it, the real benefit is that it frees up money to go to private industry to continue the research that's already there. Because like I said before, just killing deer and telling us where the endemic areas are has very limited value. Um, we're doing things to bring an end to chronic waste disease. You know, look at look at the research. I mean, you you've been a part of this. Look at the research. Look at the, the ground that we've covered in the last eight to ten years. You know, not just from the uh, you know not just from the just our, our base knowledge of how the disease is transmitted and whatnot. Um, I mean, I remember going to the U.S. the USAHA meetings five, six, seven years ago, and they were doing research trying to determine if, if chronic waste disease actually existed in in hay and soil and things like that. I mean, less than a decade ago, they didn't have answers to those questions, and now those are well established facts. And so we've come, you know, just leaps and bounds in just a, a matter of just a few years, you know, uh, recent history. Um, and then look, if you look at the you know the just selective breeding, the genetic resistance research that we're doing. Um, you know, we we have come a long way with that. The predictive uh, the predictive specificity of these tests for the live test that's huge. You know, the, the the looking at the prospect of having the ability to not have to depopulate a whole herd, just go in there and do a live test and depopulate the the affected animals, and then you know retest over a number of a few months here and there, and then maybe you you know you get out of quarantine in a in a in a fraction of the amount of time that you would have normally in the past. Uh, that's huge. I mean, that, that, that keeps you in business. That keeps you in the game. And that, that's worth its weight in gold. Uh, and, then the, and then the selective breeding, you know, for the resistance, you know, let's face it, it worked in the cattle industry. It worked in the, the sheep industry. It was a savior of those two uh, agricultural segments. And I believe that that's going to be what eventually saves the dairy industry as well. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a tomorrow type solution. It's, a, it's more of a long ball solution. And that's where all this funding comes into play. Uh, having that money for these researchers to, to push that research along to speed, you know, because you're, we're almost there. But like they always say, the, the, you know, the last little bit before you find the solution is always the hardest part. You know, getting it to the finish line is, is the very, is the, the hardest part. It, it takes the most time and it takes the most money. So hopefully, you know, getting these, getting these funding bills uh, and getting them going both on the House and the campaign inside on the Senate uh, gets that attention. But it also takes some of the animosity away between the wildlife groups in our industry, which is also very beneficial. Uh, and then the appropriation side of things, um, you know, we have to be honest, you know, we're looking at the future and we spend a lot, you and I and Sean and several other you know, state leaders, you know, we're always looking at the future. How, how can we as leaders, you know, take our industry forward and keep us viable, not just today, but next decade, decade after that, you know, two generations of deer farmers from here. Um, and that's our role. Um, but we still have to operate in the reality that is today. And so today, the, the live test has not been implemented or, or accepted in, in all the states. Um, there's still some apprehension on that and some some resistance, you know, to acceptance of that. Uh, I think with the funding uh, from on the science side that makes that test more specific and, and more accurate, I think that will eventually come. But if we're just not there yet. So we do have to deal with the reality that if you get CWD today, um, the very real likelihood is that they're going to want to depopulate you. Um, and the goal is to get those animals off the landscape as quickly as possible, which is all fine and good. But there has to be money there to indemnify those deer farmers. And as of late, we've had a significant number of farms test positive. We've had a lot of depopulations. So we've got more need than we have money to meet that need. So this year, and you were a part of that group, went up to D.C. and asked for an increase in the appropriation, uh, which would, it, I think we were at a $14 million level last appropriation cycle, asking for an increase to a $21 million level this year, uh, 15 of that to go to APHIS uh, for um, surveillance, testing, management, and response. And then of that, 6,000 remains, and they would increase of that, they would take $4 million to increase the indemnity level in, in the herd management program, which would free up more money to address the farms that are already tested positive, that are awaiting depopulation, 
but also to decrease the wait time for depopulation for future positive firms. There was a lot there. Yeah, um, and, there's a and, lot going on. And that's why it's hard to promote because we have so much, and, and these things are very complicated issues. And yes. they've been going on for five years. And so it's hard to disseminate this into a bullet point and then put it out on a Facebook post or something. You know, it's, it's difficult to, to bring people to understand what all is going on. But like the DC trip, for instance, you know, we before we went to DC, the week before, we set up Zoom calls with individual state members and state uh, board members and whatnot, uh, deer farmers, and their, their state representatives and senators, um, because most of the COVID restrictions are over now, but with all the January 6th uh, riot uh, security measures in place, it's very difficult to bring a significant number of people to DC to have any level of success with meeting with lawmakers. So we did the Zoom call with our general membership uh, the week before. And then, like you said, you and I and a, and a group of two or three other people and Sean Schaefer and Glenn Dice uh, went up to DC because it was a much more manageable, small four or five group. Because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think when we got there, I think just the week before they started in-person meetings again. Yeah, yeah been, the lawmakers were like happy to see us. They were like, yeah. hey, welcome back. And we're like, we didn't know we were gone, but yeah, we're yeah. glad to be here. That's right. Because exactly. we had been and meeting with people normally. Um, it right. was new for them. So Right, yeah. right, exactly. It, it would have been impossible to, to do that, though, with more people than we brought. Um, I didn't want people thinking we were excluding anybody because we normally bring like 15, 20 people with us. Yeah. Um, but it just would not have been workable this year for, for what we needed to do with all the security measures in place. Yeah, I, you know, I, I and I want to, I want to kind of highlight just a couple items before we wrap up and, and some of the things you said specifically about the, the DC trip, but more generally that, that kind of overarching uh, framework. And, you know, you talked about groundwork that was laid 10 years ago on the research side, and you talked about appropriations and you talked about, um, you know, the actual uh, Servid livestock program that USDA has. And then you talked about cooperative agreement money and, and it, it's all these things in tandem. And then you throw like a bunch of like behemoth wildlife agencies into the mix and an emotional topic like chronic waste disease. And it, it, I think it shows the level of uh, professionalism that Nadifa and leadership that Nadifa has shown on this issue over the past, call it 10 years, um, specifically in the past three, to push some of these big initiatives over the line. And like, it's complicated, it's hard. Like we could, we could talk for literally a couple hours about some of the specifics that you just okay. mentioned. Um, and maybe we'll do that again in the future. Uh, I just wanna give you a, 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 you know, a, a quick opportunity just to, to wrap up with some final words before we take off. Um, so the floor is yours. Appreciate it. Yeah, like I, I wouldn't be a, a, in leadership role or, or I wouldn't be well fit in leadership role if my goal was not to better the association. And, you know, let's face it, Nadifa is its members. And so, you know, during COVID, um, you know, I think it, it was difficult to do business. And I think people were not in the right mindset. You know, we couldn't have person, in-person events. Uh, I think we got a little lax. And so, you know, this last year we spent, kind of, you know, getting tooled back up to do business. Now we're, we, we had a great conference and we're in a position to actually improve now. So that's, that's my push as present this year is, uh, you know, I want people to recognize that, you know, we are here working for the members every day. We are doing something every day. Uh, we're not good about telling you about it, but we're very, we're, we're busy. We're doing stuff every day, but my goal is to do more. You know, we want to, I want to not just tell you what I'm doing, but we want to offer more value for the membership. Um, and so that, and that's, and that's the overarching goal of any, of any association is just, you know, to do better and, and do more for our members. And right now I think, uh, you know, that's needed more than ever. You know, like you said, with, the the behemoth of the, uh, wildlife agencies and the state agencies in a lot of states like yours and a few others that are just, you know, hell bent against the industry. We have a lot of uphill battles on various state levels, uh, that we try to, that we're, we're dealing with, but we got to a lot going on on the federal side too, which is equally important. So I just want the membership to know, you know, we, we are here, we're doing a lot of things on a lot of fronts. Uh, there's a lot going on, but we're not forgetting that we need to maintain and improve the, the association itself. So we're doing that too. Well, that's great to hear. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And I know that um, the members and, and listeners will, will appreciate that as well. Um, 
I thank you for uh, spending some time with me today and hopefully get a chance to catch up here in the future. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. And with that, we'll wrap up, ladies and gentlemen. As always, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk. <laughs>